Okay, we're going to uh, start Module 7, which is about globalization, and I want to talk about globalization and use the environment as a, an example of the uh, issues related to globalization, and globalization is best understood by referring to International Political Economy, or IPE. So if we think about environmental issues, they have become in increasingly important in recent years, just like the pace of economic development and population growth has quickened. And all of this is going to test the nature or the limits of nature, and the environment and globalization are both going to speak to human rights. So environmental problems have always existed, but they're just different now because today's ecological and environmental problems are increasingly global in nature and the problems of things like deforestation and global warming are much larger than any one single nation's ability to solve them. So the problems of the environment involve states as well as markets throughout the globe and so international political economy therefore must expand to accommodate these green issues of today and tomorrow and for our purposes, the environment has a huge impact, mainly on subsistence rights, but also on other types of rights, security rights in particular. And we saw that in Katrina, as well as um, other issues around the globe that you might not be as familiar with. And so, for example, on the right, there's a picture of an environmental dis uh, disaster um, where a barge bear, uh, um, uh, that had 200 uh, 2,000 tons of toxic waste was sank um, and so Greenpeace revealed that the ship was carrying toxic ash um, taken from thermal plants in Spain and from that time on Greenpeace has repeatedly demanded um, to have Spain re repatriate if you will that particular waste and that hasn't occurred so if we think about what all is being dumped in the oceans in particular what that does to food sources and many countries are very reliant upon food from the ocean for their food security. So if we think about the environment and international political economy, there is a the impact on sustainable development in particular, but any type of development of, of uh, and population growth, and this mainly impacts less developed countries, countries that are already susceptible to human rights concerns. And so there is a conundrum that has developed around the goal of sustainable development. And so the primary question for IPE regarding the environment has become, how do nations and other political actors create wealth for today's generation without at the same time depleting a despoiled and depleted environment for future generations? So how do we maintain wealth, create wealth today without depleting the Earth's resources uh, resources for the future and a depleted environment that will have dire human rights circumstances. So far there's an indication that most political actors, states, NGOs, IGOs are in agreement that in fact this is the most important question to ask about economic growth in the environment, the issue of sustainable development. However, the international system has not witnessed much progress in reconciling the goals of not destroying the environment at the same time of creating wealth. And just like we had theories of international relations, there are theories of international political economy that I want to briefly talk about. So from the realist perspective, the international political economy theory that's most aligned with that is mercantilism, liberalism, economic liberalism, and Marxism, social class theory. And so while I don't want to go into too much detail about these theories, it's important to realize that from a mercantilist perspective, this is really, um, for the state's perspective, the economy is an additional um, tool in their toolbox to accumulate wealth and power in order to enhance its independence and national security. So the state is going to intervene in the economy because of security reasons, or the state is going to be an actor in the economy to secure their security, which was an odd phrasing I know, and to ensure their security they need to increase their wealth and their power. So there's lots of different mercantilist thought and policy, but you can kind of think of mercantilism as a philosophy. It's a period of history, if you recall, and there's also 
a set of economic policies that go along with it. So in, in terms of philosophy, uh, history, mercantilism was that period of time in European history roughly from the 16th through the 19th century where those European states acquired wealth and helped raise armies to otherwise secure themselves. So wealth and power tended to generate this vicious cycle where states gained wealth and power and, uh, and they believed that they were enhancing their security but in doing so they created conditions where other states were first threatened by that state's added wealth and power. So you got into this race for colonies if you will. So classic mercantilism accounts for that type of historical period where European states were trying to accumulate wealth first at home and then abroad to enhance their power and security. Okay. And so mercantilism and realism are very complementary perspectives because realism is a political philosophy that views a nation state as a primary actor. Um, and so the primary job of the state is to acquire wealth. And so we have these policies of economic nationalism, if you will, where the state is focusing on gaining wealth and power through trade, uh, through other types of internal development, in order to promote the security of the state. And many LDCs and NICs, less developed countries and newly industrialized countries today, subscribe to this mercantilist idea that emphasizes production power and national and political uh, national, political, and economic security. So developing countries really want to use their economy to bolster their security. Um, and so we have mercantilist states today. Uh, Japan is a, is a prime example of a mercantilist state because they're always feeling insecure about certain types of resources because they have no, for example, oil of their own. So they have to use their economy to bolster their position in the international community. So today, mercantilists favor a strong or active state role in the economy, viewing state action as necessary to gain wealth and power. Or if we think about liberalism coming along, and it was really an assault on mercantilist thought with the advent of Adam Smith and his book on the wealth of nations. And so a free market is one element of the liberal view, which sees individuals as best equipped to make certain decisions about their economic future. And so liberals focus on the range of human activities that are going to reveal their, their cooperative side. And so the best interest of society, it's argued, is served by rational individual choices that when ob observed from afar appear as an invisible hand that guides the economy and promotes the common good. And this is the writing of, of Adam Smith. And it's based on the principle of the freedom of the individual. And he comes up with the philosophy of the absolute advantage, which I have there for you on the screen. Well, David Ricardo comes along and extends this liberal perspective to international trade and says that instead of winners and losers, uh, there's a positive sum game and where all players can win. So we're all going to have benefits from uh, trade, for example. So liberals um, don't just fear the state intervention, they're suspicious of power generally, including excessive concentrations of power in the market. So from the liberal perspective, they want less government intervention in the economy. Okay, So they think the free market is going to uh, provide um, benefits for all, and all boats will rise, for example, as opposed to the mercantilist realist perspective of winners and losers. And then, of course, we have Marxism. And Marx understood history as this dynamic process. Um, this is also referred to as structuralist a perspective or social class theory. And so Marx argued that uh, capitalism evolved to overcome feudalism, and this in turn would be overcome by socialism and eventually communism. So Marx sees the economy as a class struggle between the bourgeois class, the owners, um, and then the proletariat who is the wage laborer who lacks any power and don't own the um, means of production anymore. And he sees this as an exploitation. And you can start to see how this is going to have a human rights component. So Marx saw capitalism as a, as a form of the economy that's going to go into a crisis mode at some point because of unevenness uh, due to competition. Capitalism is going to become more unstable the proletariat are going to become even more alienated from their work and this is going to produce a revolution in the crisis of capitalism. 
and capitalism therefore contains the seeds of its own demise in the form of private ownership of capital, of wage labor, and competition that Marx sees as destructive. So in terms of competition, if we think about mercantilists view competition as a zero-sum battle, winners and losers, Adam Smith and economic liberals believe competition prevents any one class or group becoming too powerful or too weak that it's really all boats will rise again. Marx believes all parties lose due to this competition. And he argues that competition drives down the wages of workers, which decreases their ability to purchase as many goods as before, and this is going to hurt business. And so you can start to see in this very Marxist socialist view the concerns of the workers, and this is where we get that split in the human rights field with individuals from socialist, communist backgrounds more concerned about these issues of subsistence as opposed to political rights. Um, so if we think about these particular views, um, well, the revolution, of course, didn't occur, but what you have is uh, Lenin coming along who makes an argument that the revolution didn't occur because the capitalists used their money to invest abroad in these colonies. And so you have international concerns between the North and the South, the haves and the have-nots. And that evolved into what's called world systems theory, where capitalism of the world, um, where the capital-rich industrial core states dominate the world system, and you have these exploited smaller states in the periphery and semi-periphery. And it's these smaller states that are weaker, the less developed countries, that bear the brunt of much of the subsistence rights violations that we see. So if we look at the environment and how this is going to impact human rights, from a mercantilist perspective, you have competition for the resources. And so whether it's oil or water or whatever other resource we don't know exists yet, Mercantilists believe you have to find some monopoly on that particular resource because it's a component of national interests and security. Liberals think the market is going to take care of the, the, the process or the use of resources, and those resources are going to be redistributed based on the market. And it might be that the hegemon steps in to try and lay down some rules for the international community to adhere to when it comes to resources. And for liberals, the best way to deal with issues like clean air, like environmental issues, is simply to, to privatize because people care more about things if there's ownership involved. And then structuralists or Marxists are going to believe that there's always going to be this strain or tension between economic development and sustainable development because in the past, and history has shown, that the first world, the developed world, developed first and now they're expecting those individuals in developing countries to develop at the same rate without destroying the environment like the people did in the first world. So there's an environmental regime just like there is a um, human rights regime and so the same types of organizations that are dealing with human rights also deal with issues of the environment. So you have the UN instead of the human rights program they have an environmental program you have uh, international economic institutions that deal with the environment. You also have NGOs such as Greenpeace, and there's a whole lot of NGOs. But we also have multinational corporations that are at play when it comes to the environment. All right. Well, there's a concept in the international uh, in environmental world called the global commons. And we should think, uh, take a few minutes to think about what the environment is. It is basically a common area for all of us. But the problems become that we all use it, but none of us are directly responsible for the environment. The dilemma then comes, is there going to be enough resources to sustain the growing levels of population? So we have the twin problems of a growing population and a depletion of scarce resources. So Thomas Malthus came along and made an argument that population grows geometrically, whereas food production grows arithmetically. And if you do the math, the prediction was that famine and disease was going to become commonplace and lead to social and political unrest. Because at some point, you read a point of crisis where the population outstrips the amount of resources that are available. So how do you overcome this problem? 
Well, for Malthus, wars and natural disasters will take care of some of the population for you. But that's not very good social policy. We can't just expect to kill off people because we don't have enough resources. So the historical record tells us that the population is going to continue to grow. But this, this particular issue assumes lack of innovation. There's been revolutions in farming techniques and technology. In reality, what we have is food production has outgrown population. So it's really not food production that's the problem, but rather food distribution. But there's still some concern, not about population growth in general, but the distribution of growth. So for example, in Europe, there's a zero growth in population. It's just maintaining and even decreasing. It's in the developed world that you have growth approaching 5% in terms of population. And so this leads to concerns about what is called the tragedy of the commons. In 1972, a report entitled The Limits to Growth was published. It contained a set of projections for the world based on economic and environmental trends since World War II and argued that if previous pattern continued, there'd be environmental damage and that would start to constrain global progress. And so we have what is called the tragedy of commons which was coined by Garrett Hardin. And he uses the term tragedy of the commons to illustrate that people act in the short term for selfish gain. So one way to think of this definition of the tragedy of the commons is to think that the Earth's stock of resources is limited. There's finite sources of things such as oil that can be used up. Living resources such as forests and fish runs that can be overused and depleted. For the most part, the environment is a collective good, one that is shared by everyone but owned by no one. So the, tra the tragedy of the commons explains how and why communal goods are overused or depleted. It's in the, each user's self-interest to use up more of the goods since the cost is largely borne by others. And that doesn't occur when a good or resource is privately owned. This is why liberals like to privatize. When many people and states follow their self-interest, depletion of environmental resources results. This is kind of like the free rider problem projected into the future. So Hardin uses an analogy of overgrazing, a commons, to explain the relationship of population to the, availab uh, excuse me, the av availability of food. He argued that the world was much like the commons, whereupon only so many animals could graze without eventually destroying it. Well, that's a natural inclination of individuals, is to use things to their advantage. People act in the short term and continually produce ever-increasing number of, say, livestock, which eventually required more and more of the commons. And all of the people acting this way in concert eventually used up the commons, dooming the individual and then society at large. So for Hardin, certain freedoms and liberties must be restricted or people would destroy the environment. So what do you do if you're Garrett Hardin? Do you encourage smaller families? Well, this is private behavior. What are the social consequences of trying to legislate procreation, for example, give tax relief for having smaller families? You know, this is reminiscent of the China one-child policy. We know the devastating effects of that in terms of human rights. Should we eliminate international food programs? We have too much food. Because famine, believe it or not, um, is a sign of overpopulation. Repeated famine signal that states have failed to address problems of population growth. So what we really have is the resource puzzle. Um, guard, uh, Herit, uh, Garrett Hardin argues that international aid saves, uh, serves as a lifeboat that allows people to perpetuate the cycle. While feeding starving people is the moral thing to do, the long-run result is overpopulation and famine. So we can see how this resource puzzle it creates an environmental issue that becomes political and economic as well as human rights issues. I mean, can we really stop feeding starving people? Is that really the answer? So again, this book, Our Common Future, uh, was a report actually by the UNEP that was uh, published in 18, 1987.
that shifted attention to the connection between the environment and the survival of developing nations in particular. And the report linked hunger, debt, economic growth, and other issues to environmental problems. And so this is why the environment is such a crucial issue to human rights. And there's really three parts to the resource puzzle. First, we need to maintain Global North development. Nobody in the Global North wants to give up all of their material possessions or the progress that has been made, although there is a movement to have a smaller carbon footprint. But there's also the second part, which is to increase the Global South's development. And then how do you do all three of that without destroying the environment? So there has to be some sort of regulation of resource allocation and usage. And so what has the global what has been the global response to that? In 1968, you had a meeting called the Club of Rome, and it was a meeting of scientists to address the problems of population growth and resources. And their findings are published in this book called The Limits to Growth. And the general conclusions of this book is that the world was built specifically, um, uh, I'm sorry, that the, the that what they were wanting to do is look at five major trends, accelerating industrialization, rapid population growth, widespread malnutrition, the depletion of renewable resources, and a deteriorating environment. And they said in spite of the preliminary state of their work, they believe it's important to publish uh, their findings. And they argued that, number one, if the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. The most probable result will be a sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. Secondly, they said it's possible to alter these growth trends and to establish a condition of ecological and economic stability that is sustainable far into the future. The state of global equilibrium, they said, could be designed so that the basic material needs of each person on Earth are satisfied and each person has an equal opportunity to realize their human potential. If the world's people, they said, decide to strive for the second outcome rather than the first, the sooner they begin working to attain it, the greater will be their chances of success. Ultimately, they argue that the world has a certain carrying capacity the ability, that is, to sustain a population and absorb waste. And once breached, something is going to give. And the usual victim to that is the world's poor. So they argue that there's renewable and there's non-renewable resources. The renewable food, non-renewable is oil types of things. So these are just two examples. And the limit is called the carrying capacity. The, compared, uh, the carrying capacity is the Earth's limit. And so they argued once again that if this isn't done, the current capacity is going to be reached and the victims of that are going to be the world's poor. So we have two competing visions about what to do. You have the neo-traditionalists, those individuals such as those who, um, uh, Garrett Hardin, and these groups tend to accept a fatalistic view that people are constrained by natural forces and limits and people need to adjust to the limits of growth. So they're arguing if we don't stop our behavior, we're going to be limited. Modernists, on the other hand, have faith in people's ability to overcome, more along the lines of necessity as a mother of invention, that people have the intellectual and technical capacity to overcome challenges presented by human and economic growth. So modernist assumptions are that the global population is going to level off. After all, we already see negative population growth in many areas of the world. That wealth and fertility are inversely related. So you tend to have a smaller population, particularly as women's roles change with industrialization. The more educated women are, the less number of children they're likely to have. And many of the previously predicted limitations have over, been overcome by innovation. So societies have been able to increase food production through technology or ge genetically modified food. Energy sources, people argue, are they really that scarce? What if, so what if fossil fuels are depleted? Is there other ways to find um, sources of energy? Is global warming really a problem? These are what modernists, these are the types of questions that modernists are asking. And problems tend to be a function of public, bad, bad public policies, they argue.
and one of the things to do is try to figure out how to overcome the free rider problem in the international arena. So who should pay for clean air? Who should pay for water? So if we start to look at the major areas of concern, if you think about on the, when we're talking about the earth, pollution, deforestation, decertification, biodiversity. And deforestation is an example of the classic tragedy of the commons. Tropical rainforests occupy only half the surface of the earth that they did 50 years ago. And much concern about deforestation is centered on LDCs. LDCs wish to defect from cooperative solution efforts since they would bear much of the cost and gain uh, from their uh, participation. And so we are desperately trying to educate individuals um, uh, in less developed countries about the necessity of maintaining the, um, uh, the rainforest for, uh, for the future. Um, and so you have um, people concerned working through NGOs and other international organizations to deal with the issues of deforestation. When it comes to the air, we have the issues of global warming. Scientists fear that global warming will cause decreased rainfall and droughts that will threaten international food security. There's also a fear of sea level rising, uh, damaging water ground supplies, covering many island nations, and producing a large number of refugees. And we've already talked about the problems of refugees. On the other hand, you have skeptics of global warming. And it's been argued that the resources required to combat global warming would be better spent addressing issues such as HIV AIDS, ensuring access to safe drinking water, and continuing economic development. And then when it comes to the water, we have the issues of ocean dumping, uh, particularly the issues of nuclear waste dumping. And the ocean is, again, a, class, a classical communal good. And ocean dumping illustrates the tragedy of the commons. And there are many other sources of waste that ends up in the world's oceans. And so this, again, is a human rights issue because of so many societies and peoples that are dependent upon food sources that come from the ocean. I want to just concentrate uh, for the rest of this uh, on, on this issue of nuclear weapons and the environmental pack impact of, of nuclear dumping. I grew up in the nuclear era on a military base, and so I was always afraid of dying in a nuclear holocaust. But beyond that, we practiced the art of duck and cover. And so this is a cartoon that talks about how to survive, if you will, a nuclear attack. Um, I won't show you this video, but if you Google duck and cover, you can see Bert the duck who is walking along and learning to duck and cover as a practice. This eventually evolved into the tornado drills that many young children have today. So I'll let you um, enjoy that at your own leisure. All right. Um, but the nuclear testing uh, started, of course, during World War II and at the end of World War II in the Bikini Atoll is where a lot of this at testing took place. And so atomic bomb tests were done in 1946. This is referred to as Operation Crossroads. And the, the two famous ones are the Abel and Baker test. And so this is a video that shows, um, shows that, um, perhaps. Let me get back uh, so that I can get it on this slide so that you can see it. Okay. Here we go. Maybe. All right, here we go. 
bomb missed its intended target by nearly 800 yards. The blast sent five ships, including two destroyers, to the bottom of Bikini Lagoon. All ships within a half a mile of the blast were heavily damaged. But damage was nowhere near that created by the following underwater blast known as Shot Baker. Okay, so those testing, uh, those were done uh, as part of the um, n ships that were used as uh, decoys, if you will, out there to see what happened to the ship. The US Indep USS Independence was one of those, um, and we can, they showed the wreckage of, of this, uh, took photos. Well, then they decided to just sink it um, in place. And so what we have now is uh, the question of what do you do with and where do you put a radioactive warship? Um, you know, this is not a debate on whether or not nuclear testing should be or shouldn't be done. The question now becomes what do we do with this radioactive warship and what did they do with it? Um, for many of those... Um, the camp, deep, uh, ships that were contaminated, they were brought to a Hunter's Point shipyard in, in California to, to go through a, slant, a sand blasting process to try and decontaminate de these ships. Okay. Um, others were sank. And so now if uh, what's left of that particular shipyard is obviously off limits and you see this um, this is a, an area that you don't want to go into should you see this little sign. Um, but there is an attempt now to try and figure out how to do some sort of economic development in that region. And so in California there are plans to try and um, develop this particular area that once was the site of decontamination. And so this of course has um, implications for the security of individuals. There's also the Farallon Island nuclear waste dump, which has a, a lot of nuclear waste, and this is where some low-level radioactive waste was dumped into the ocean floors between 46 and 1970, and this is where the marine sanctuary is. And so you can start to see uh, the shipping lanes um, are uh, where the ships leave the port of San Francisco, um, but this is where some of the dumping signs have uh, uh, sites are and then of course you have the in green the sanctuary boundaries so you start to see how the contamination of nuclear waste is going to interfere with food supply and uh, you know marine life in general and you can kind of get a, a sense of how far out we're talking off the west coast there <laughs> 
But beyond that, the international response, oh dear, that's not what I meant to do. The international response uh, to um, uh, the environmental issues deal back with the hole in the ozone. Uh, it was discovered in 1975, and the hole in the ozone is linked to CFC emissions, and so states were able to agree to work toward reductions of CFC. In 1987, you had the book again called Our Common Future. Um, uh, uh, in 1987 to 88, you had the Montreal Protocol that dealt with the whole, uh, hole in the ozone. In 1992, you had what's called the Earth Summit in Rio, and this was where states got together and there was a general agreement on the principle that climate change was and should be a concern for humanity and humans played a role in the depletion of the o of the ozone and so this is where we start to see the idea of, er, of sustainable development occur then you had the Kyoto Protocol in 1997 and this really starts to show the divisions between the global north and global south um, where the global north uh, and the global south had what are called common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, and this is where China and other less developed countries refused to even uh, a, a weak opt-in measure for, to, per, for participation because LDCs believed that they should be excluded because they were still emitting less than the global north, particularly the United States and the Soviet Union at the time. It was necessary for economic development. How would they catch up if they weren't allowed to admit like the Global North had emitted? And they needed help from industrialized countries. The U.S. wanted reductions. They wanted to propose cuts in reductions. They wanted a treaty to be market-based, the privatization, if you will, of, of emission credits. And they wanted meaningful participation by LDCs. So the treaty was agreed upon where there would be reductions in Global North emissions. There was a market-based approach. However, uh, the LDCs balked on meaningful participation. And this really killed the deal for the U.S. when common but differentiated responsibilities became part of the plan. From the LDC's perspective, one official said, very many of us are struggling to attain a decent standard of living for our peoples. And yet we are constantly told that we must share in the effort to reduce emissions so that industrialized countries can continue to enjoy the benefits of their wasteful lifestyle. The U.S. Congress, this is in the 1990s, Newt Gingrich was the speaker, uh, said, I find it profoundly wrong that approximately 134 countries were allowed to vote on a treaty by which they will never be bound. So you can see the difference between the developed countries, the developing countries, and at least that of the United States. And the result was the Clinton administration did not send the treaty to Congress for a vote. And the United States is still not a party to the Kyoto Protocol. And in fact, the U.S. withdraws. And so you see uh, in 2001, George Bush um, um, removes the United States from the Kyoto Protocol. Then, of course, we have the in inconvenient truth uh, um, that was the documentary by Al Gore. So what are these solutions as we start to, to wrap up here? Should we limit population growth? There is no conclusive evidence that overpopulation itself is a global problem. Reduced numbers of people in a society does not necessarily mean that consumption of fewer resources is going to occur. Okay. What about new technology in the environmental regime? Technology can provide more environmentally sound production processes, but it's often difficult to acquire and is often not appropriate for developing nation stage of development. So we have to move beyond the, the nation state and international organizations and regimes are important. Some new global institutions should be created to deal with some of these issues because regimes appear to be effective in dealing with some issues like human rights, but maybe not some others. What about uh, privatizing, eco-politics, green IPE. Some global environmental problems may be addressed by establishing property rights to consumer goods or com communal goods, allowing markets to create, uh, to be created for pollution rights. And this may be one way to address the tragedy of the commons. Uh, 
There's also some new visions. New social values and norms might lead to a green IPE. Some Christian communities, for example, em emphasize the value of stewardship and trusteeship over the earth and its resources. But many people are relying upon sustainable development. This goal is hard to precisely define and needs to be brought into the forefront of both issues of environment and human rights. Some argue that the lack of political support will make this goal unattainable. Many believe that the environmental problems are more likely to be solved at the local level than at the international level by international organizations. So that's where we'll stop this particular uh, lecture and then I have another lecture about the issue of food in particular and how it's related to human rights.